Okay, so um, yeah, thank you very much everybody uh, for joining this session today. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Dirk Gerbrich and I'm working as a general manager for the technical department um, at Danza Wave. And um, what I would like to show you today is uh, two solutions we provide for uh, parameter protection and access control. Good, so um, let's have a quick look at a, a typical scenario. Um, we have, let's say we have a, fa a facility which we want to protect and, um, and uh, for this we have some uh, uh, challenges um, in the perimeter uh, protection of course. So uh, we have, let's say, a wide parking space where we want to uh, um, check if there are any intruders or, or visitors or whatsoever coming. Um, <clears throat> and um, we can uh, have different zones. Uh, so let's say in, in the parking lot, we just want to know if there is something. If, um, let's say, during the night somebody is coming, closer to the building, um, we want to make sure that we get an alarm on this. So we might have different zones where we have different requirements of uh, the observation. And uh, for sure, I mean, um, we want to have our alarms and warnings only if, uh, if there is really a, a threat and not if there is, let's say, a cat walking over the parking spot and close to the building or if there are birds or, or other objects in in the facility which does not uh, matter to us <clears throat> and then um, looking at our building um, we have uh, possibly need for access control because um, there is stuff inside where we want to make sure that only people um, can enter the building or enter certain locations in the building certain rooms who are only uh, authorized for this um, and um, one of the challenges might be that we want to have a, a, a system which is as simple as possible. So um, maybe we don't want to have a database connection or, or any infrastructure connection to the outside world. Um, and for sure, access control always uh, comes uh, into challenges with the GDPR. So um, if, if we're doing access control, we're usually handling personal data. So, um, and according to the regulations we have, um, we have to keep uh, track on this and make sure that the, the personal data which we store um, is only used in the, in the way it is intended to be used. Good, so um, let's have a first look at the parameter protection and the first solution. So. Um, what we would need is a detection system um, which can cover our large spaces. Um, and of course, we want to have a, a, a system which, which can cover the whole area, but this um, on, a, on a cost which um, is acceptable at the end of the day. Um, as already mentioned, we might have the need for different zones. So we have different areas uh, where we have uh, different security requirements and, and protection requirements. So we want to have a system where we can set up our area or our, our land, which we want to protect in with different zones. And um, for sure, we want to make sure that the alarms we get are really linked to an actual threat and not, not false alarms or something like this. Good, let me show the solution we have for this. Um, this is called our Zone D. It's a security laser sensor. Um, <clears throat> so as I said, it, it's working with laser. So um, we have um, the, the sensor in a range so that we can cover an area up to 80 meters from the sensor. Um, so, and as we are using um, laser, um, infrared laser light here in this case, we are not even relying on the um, lightning conditions uh, in, in the area. So even in, in the darkest night, um, we can still have uh, good results with this sensor. Um, of course, we can connect the sensor, we can uh, connect it easily to cameras and make sure that the sensor is controlling a camera for tracking objects which we, which we detect in the area. And um, yeah, we have the possibility 
um, what we need to filter out objects which we don't want to see or which we don't want to recognize. The, lens or the, 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 the sensor is seeing them, but um, we can make sure that alarms only are set off when we really want to have it. And uh, sure, this all working read time um, and remotely. Good. Um, let me explain a little bit where the zone D is coming from. Um, Danso is, is not only um, a company providing equipment in the O2ID, uh, IoT, and robotics area, but Danso is one of the largest um, car suppliers, car manufacturer suppliers. So um, this technology is coming from, from the automotive industry, where we're using the same technology for emergency braking systems or distance control systems in cars, when we have the same technology inside, um, we're not only using radar, but we're using as well uh, laser sensors here. So in the automotive industry, the security requirements are extremely high. And this is why the, the zone D, as it is based on, on the same technology, um, is following the same requirements and, and the same standards from the automotive industry. So this is a highly reliable product um, which we have here. So um, let's have a quick look. As I said, we, we, we're doing surface uh, detection here. So um, if we look at the general IR sensors, so we can have line type where, of course, uh, an intruder can simply jump over or or go under. Um, we can add our parameters setting up uh, line curtains um, as shown there, but um, this requires a lot of uh, infrastructure, a lot of sensors, and, and so, and this is of course increasing the cost in this case as well. And we can cover all this up with zone D, which is um, a laser sensor um, emitting a beam in, in a, a radius and um, this beam is reflected and then um, we get the result. If there if there is an echo, um, we can detect how far is the echo away from the sensor and using this then we can discover objects and we can uh, discover where the objects in, in the surveyed area are. Good. Um, <clears throat> As I said, we have a, um, a radius up to 80 meters around the sensor where we can uh, still get results. We have a, a valid detection area um, of up to 30 meters. So um, we can detect moving objects um, in, in this area. We have an object detection area of, of 30 to 60 meters. So using this, we can have maybe only one sensor in our facility, depending of course on, on the area which we want to cover, um, or only a few sensors to cover a whole area. Um, we will see later on some examples, of course, um, if, if I have a, a huge facility, then for sure I need to have more of these sensors. But um, this is even then drilling the cost down compared to, um, laser curtains or, or laser line sensors, and of course, increasing the uh, reliability. We can, um, this, this is some pictures showing um, how this could be installed. So you see here some, some typical installations um, always combined with a PDZ camera. So uh, because what the sensor can do, the sensor is a, is a completely standalone working system. Um, and we can connect the camera um, on the network, the sensor on the network, and then using the, the network link between the sensor and the camera, the sensor can automatically track the camera. And if there are objects moving in this surveilled area, um, it can control the camera and make sure that the camera is following this object. So having an additional um, functionality, uh, we can look at our camera view and see if there is an object what it is, is it something where we need to take care of or not? And of course, uh, the sensor can automatically control warning equipment like flashlights or speakers um, without having any other host device. So the, the sensor can do this controlled on their own. 
we configure the sensor, we say the sensor, this is the areas which you have to survey. And if somebody, if an object or something is going into this area, then light the warning light or play a sound or something like this to make sure that the people work, uh, walking into this area are getting alerted as well. Good, as I already said, um, <clears throat> we have, uh, or, or well, we have basically two possibilities to mount the sensor. One is the horizontal. So um, in this case, we have a, a certain area which we can survey. And in this area, we can define um, some zones um, where we can monitor if people or objects are moving into this zone. Um, maybe this gets a bit more clearer later on if, if I show you some examples. Um, and the other possibility is we can mount the, the sensor vertically. And of course, the mounting position, we need to configure the sensor and we need to tell the sensor how it is mounted. So to make sure that, that the results we get are the ones we want. Um, if I have a vertical mount, I'm creating something like a curtain again. But the curtain is built up here. We can have a 60 meter curtain um, with only one device and uh, without having extra infrastructure like poles on the end of the curtain or something like this. And then we can detect if something is moving through the curtain or into the curtain and is reflected from the, from the laser. Good, um, let's say we have a vertical mount situation here. We have a PDZ camera, we have a control room and um, with a filtering function, we can say, okay, um, we have a, a certain minimum size of an object which we want to track. So let's say if there is an animal or a bird or a cat or something like this moving through the laser light, then uh, we don't want to have an alarm. So the filter function is quite usable to make sure that we're only detection, detecting like human people or cars or as shown here, motorcycles or something like this. So this is one of one of the, the biggest uh, functionalities uh, which we have. And um, now I would like to show you um, some, some examples of where we have installed the Zone D. At the moment, we have approximately five, about 500 projects in Japan where the Zone D laser sensor is working and in, in operation. Um, <clears throat> one of the examples is the uh, periphery monitoring at uh, some uh, Japanese airports. Um, so we see here the, the zone D laser sensor is mounted vertically. So we, we um, add an additional protection, uh, a laser fence uh, in front of the uh, actual fence of the airport. So in this case, if somebody is coming too close to the real fence of the airport, um, we can get immediately an, an alarm. And if we have additional PDZ cameras mounted there, then uh, <clears throat> we can in the control room immediately get an image of uh, what is happening and, and who is there. It might be that this is just uh, yeah, a worker uh, which should be there, maybe inspecting the fence or something like this, or it could be an intruder, and then we can easily monitor this. And as well with the filtering function here, we can uh, make sure that if there are animals going close to the fence, like cats, dogs, or rats, or rabbits, or whatever you can think of, um, we can make sure that we don't get an alarm on this. We only get an alarm if the object has a certain size, so if it is a human being or something like this. Good, a second example which is uh, showing a, a typical vertical mount. Um, this is a surveillance of a, of a railway crossing. So here in this case, we are using two sensors um, to monitor the area of the railway crossing. and. Uh, in this scenario, we can get uh, easy information if, uh, let's say, the crossings are closed, but there is still a car in between, or there are still uh, people walking in between and trying to cross it just in front of the train. And then uh, we can sound alarms, or we can send alarms directly to the um, um, train driver so that he gets aware, oh, there uh, is a possible obstacle. Um, so uh, I better start slowing down to make sure that I'm not crashing into this object. 
So these are um, some examples uh, for the perimeter protection. Now I would like to have a, a quick look at the access control. So um, as we said in the beginning, the challenges are um, we, we have to protect sensitive areas. And um, so we need to provide a solution for um, securely identifying that the people who are entering this area are supposed to enter this area and that these people are really the people we are expecting there and not somebody who has stolen an entry pass or something like this. So um, possibly we're talking here of some biometric data which we want to track and, and uh, which we want to use here for the um, access control and authentication. And um, to keep the infrastructure as low as possible, we would like to prefer uh, maybe a system which is com possible to work completely offline. Um, so, um, and um, yeah, we have a solution um, which is called Phase uh, SQRC. This is a, a combination system based of uh, face recognition technology and using our um, SQR code. Um, as you might know, the company Danzo developed the QR code in um, 1984. Um, uh, and um, we continued on developing QR code and adding additional technologies. And one of the technologies is the SQR code. I will explain a little bit later on on how the SQR code is working. But let me put it this way, the SQR code is possible or, or has the capability of storing encrypted data into the code. And this is for, for this solution, it's quite crucial. Um, one of the uh, requirements was the data protection and using the encryption in the QR code, um, we can make sure that the, the facial data, so the personal data which we're taking of a person is stored in a secure way. Good, let's have um, a look how this could be working. So um, we have usually two points. One, one is a point where we're creating the uh, phase SQRC. Um, <clears throat> this is a registration desk or something, or if, if somebody is coming into a, a company, he's getting his ID card or he's getting his access card. And um, so what we would do is we take a photo of the person or we scan a picture from the passport. And then um, on a host device, or this could be a PC or computer, so it, it does not need to be a ser server running in, in the cloud or something like this. It, it's a local device. We're taking this picture, we're analyzing the facial data, and um, based on this one, we're creating an SQR code. And the SQR code is storing um, the facial data in the encrypted, encrypted area. I will refer to this one later on. Um, the SQR code has basically two areas, a public area, which you can read with any QR code reader, um, and an, an encrypted area, which you can only read with uh, readers where you have the necessary code uh, or key installed. Good, so this is the area of creation. So we can print out the code, we can print it on their ID cards, or we can simply uh, send the code to their smartphones so their smartphone is getting their um, authentication ID. So the next step then would be the authentication process. So here we do two things. First we scan the SQR code and get the facial uh, feature data out of the SQR code where it is stored encrypted. And then the second thing is we're taking a, a, a picture, a live picture of the, of the people in front of the uh, entrance point. And uh, then again, we have a local system, no connection to the cloud, no connection to a database um, where we can uh, then match the data which we scan from the code to the face which we get prevented and then decide, okay, this is the person and he has access to this area or not. 
Good, yeah. So this this is a bit explaining how this is working. So the, the main features is um, we don't need a server, we don't need a database, so we can reduce implementation costs um, to a minimum limit. Um, the facial features are only stored in the SQRC and the SQRC is with the person. So the person is always keeping his personal data with him. So if it is printed out, he has the personal data on a card or on a batch and, and it's his personal data going with the person. So he um, is responsible for what is happening to the data. So the data is not stored in a database, not stored in a server. So this is highly GDPR compliant. The whole system is offline. Um, as I said, the authentication process we don't need infrastructure, we don't need a network connection, we don't need a connection to a server or a database. So um, again, we can reduce the cost and the infrastructure. Um, the system is fast, uh, for sure. And um, yeah, we can have a, a very reliable identification and making sure that the person presenting the SQR code and presenting the face is really the person which we are expecting there and is allowed to enter this facility. Okay, so um, as I already said, maybe a, a short uh, outlook on, on um, the SQRC. Um, <clears throat> the SQRC is a code which looks like a QR code. So if you scan this code, with uh, a standard QR reader, um, it's no problem. You can scan the code and there is a public section in the code where you can put a URL or public data um, and everybody can read this with a, with a general QR reader from a smartphone and get the public information. But as well, and this is not recognized by any of the readers, um, only um, recognized by specialized readers, there is an encrypted section and um, to read the encrypted section, of course, you have to have the right key because when we create the code, we uh, use a certain key to create the code. The key can be defined uh, by the, the, the user or the customer. And uh, for sure, we have to make sure that the, uh, the same key is stored in the readers um, because otherwise the readers cannot decrypt the data which is stored in the code. So, um, and doing this, we can then get the, uh, the secure data. So uh, in this application, we're storing the facial feature data into the secured area, into the encrypted area to make sure that it stays in the code and can only be read with certain devices which are connected to the system. Um, <clears throat> maybe some, some examples on, on where this could be used or, or where this is actually used. Uh, we can use it in event locations. Um, today, a lot of uh, event tickets are personalized tickets. So uh, with a very simple system here, we can make sure that the people who are trying to enter an event or amusement park are the people who are the ones who bought the ticket um, for the ex amusement park. Let's say you have a um, a yearly ticket, um, then we can add this uh, information and you're not supposed to pass on this yearly ticket to somebody else. So uh, with this system, we can make sure that the people who have bought the yearly ticket for the amusement park are the people who are entering the amusement park. For sure, storage room uh, or security room like a server room, uh, we can use this to make sure that um, the people in front have not stolen an uh, um, ID card for somebody else and trying to enter this room now. Um, hospital example, um, let's say um, we have a, um, yeah, a, a, a room where we can get the drugs and, and for, for the pres prescriptions. And we want to make sure that only certain people are allowed to enter this um, this locker, and um, because only uh, certain people should uh, give out these uh, medicines to people. Um, in a production line, we can make sure that uh, only the people who are working for the company are allowed to enter the production line. Um, <clears throat> 
And finally, um, let's say a manufacturing field or a construction site, this is something where we're certainly uh, working a lot with. Um, it's very important to make sure that only people who are registered are entering a construction site. And um, so the, the construction companies are really having taken care of this. And uh, with this system, we can have an easy registration. So let's say there is a delivery expected. And of course, we want to grant access to the site for the driver. So um, he has to identify himself and we know who is coming. He has pre-registered and then we can make sure at the entrance gate that this is really the driver we're expecting and not somebody, somebody else. Good. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. That's it, basically, um, I've shown you today uh, two possible solutions. One for uh, the parameter protection using the Denso Zone D uh, security laser sensor and the second one for access control with uh, the phase SQRC, so um, a combination of uh, secured QR code and facial recognition. Yes, that's it from my side, so... Um, are there any questions? First of all, thank you for taking the time to present today. You're welcome. Um, see, there are some questions. The first one is, what is the ap approximation of cost for the sensor? Um, yeah, that's uh, uh, difficult to answer from my side because um, as you've seen, I'm, I'm, I'm a total technical guy. Um, I would, uh, if, if there is any interest, I would ask you to get in contact with us and then we can make sure that somebody of our sales team um, is providing the needed information on this one. Yeah, you can make sure that you visit Denzel in the digital exhibition as well. That is already open. Um, the next question, how robust are the laser sensors against manipulation or physical violence? Well, um, yeah, of course. I mean, um, if, if, if we look how, how we're mounting the, the sensors, um, we're mounting them onto our uh, facility. Of course, if somebody is approaching the sensor, then we would get an alarm. If he's then using a baseball bat and, and smashing the sensor, of course, this is, is possible. Um, but um, to enter or to get close to the sensor, he has to get into the range of the sensor. And for sure, we will then have an alarm on this one. So um, let me put it this way. Of course, you can destroy the sensor, um, but not without being recognized. Okay. We have another price question that you may be able to answer. How about the average list price of Zone D? Uh, I have to admit, I um, have <laughs> no information about the, even the, the list prices on this one. I, I have to say sorry here. Um, really, this is something um, which uh, can be answered by ourselves or our partners, uh, which you can find on our website as well. And there is a final question. What is the process to buy an SQRC-enabled reader? Well, that's that's quite simple. Um, to read SQRC, you can either buy one of the sensor, uh, the sorry, the Denso readers. Um, all our Denso 2D readers, if it is a, a terminal, uh, Android-based uh, terminal, or if it is a fixed mount scanner or something like this. Um, they are all enabled to read SQR code. Um, for sure, the SQR code is a security technology, so we are not giving away the decoding um, algorithms, but we have a technology, um, it's called Q-Platform. Um, this then is a, a cloud-based um, platform system which we can offer to generate and um, decode SQR codes. So um, if somebody is interested in this, um, I would recommend to get in contact uh, with us um, and then um, we can provide a little bit more information on how this is working. And uh, so as I said, you can either use our Denso manufactured devices or if you want to integrate this into your um, 
smartphone application, then we can use the two platform. We are providing a certain APIs then for this. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Those were all the questions for now. If you are available later, maybe we can get some more questions in the chat. But thank you very much. And you can also check out Denzo at the digital exhibition.